also plays a role in balance and equilibrium. Right. And so these receptors for hearing and sound are both <clears throat> localized in the inner ear, right, where the outer and the middle ear are just focused on allowing you to be able to hear. Right. Let's look at the outer ear. Right. I mean, it has some essential components. Right. It's got this large lobe out here. Right. <clears throat> this auricle or peanut out here. Right. And it's composed of a helix and a lobule. Right. It's here. To help you better detect sound, effectively like a funnel to be able to direct that sound into the external auditory canal. Now, I mean, really, does it actually do a role? I mean, if this actually does a role in being able to allow you to pick up more sound, wouldn't you think that there are some organisms that have evolved to have large, effectively connect collecting devices on the outside of their head here? Those organisms that perhaps they actually have predators in this world, unlike us, it's nice sitting on top, isn't it? Right? You don't need to turn your back every six seconds to see whether or not a wolf is after you. But there are guys out there who do need to worry about this. Right? And <clears throat> this guy can detect sounds from over three kilometers away. Right? So he has a large collection system here. Now, this doesn't just collect sound, right? It's here for <coughs> controlling uh, temp body temperature as well. You can see these blood vessels out here. Right? So it allows them to be able to dissipate heat faster. But another role that it plays for this guy, right? it allows him to know whether or not that fox is actually creeping up from behind him. Not only does he hear from far distances, he can turn each of these ears independently. You know, one can be upfield, one downfield, right? So I can get a nice uh, <coughs> hearing view of what's going on around it. All right, so this outer ear, <clears throat> we have a canal here. <clears throat> this canal, this auditory canal, extends through what's known as the external acoustic amiatus. Oh, that sounds so familiar, right? Where was that? Did we identify that when we did bones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. That right. was really prominent. Easy to pick up, wasn't it? All right, so we know where that is. Right. This is where that ear canal is passing through the skull here. Right. So <clears throat> it's lined with skin that contains hairs. There are also a couple of glands that are associated with sebaceous and ruminous glands. Right. In order to be able to effectively protect it and keep it moist in there. Right. <clears throat> and the reason for having this is to allow the collection of sound waves and direct them toward the middle. So it transmits those uh, sound waves to the eardrum. The eardrum. Hmm. We know this guy. Now, <clears throat> we, as healthcare providers, uh, we might call it an eardrum for trying to communicate with our patient, but when we talk to each other, right, we call, call it the tympanic membrane. And when you look down, if you have any young children at home, I know they've had an ear infection, haven't they? Every child gets at least 100 of them. <laughs> and when that happens, you can look down in here, right, and this guy gets really red. Right? So this tympanic membrane now is that effectively that division between the outer ear and the middle ear. When that sound wave moves into that uh, ear canal, it causes this tympanic membrane to vibrate. And so effectively, it's transmitting that sound along to the next component in the system here to the middle ear, right? And so the middle ear, right, the middle ear responds to sound by effectively having these three small bones vibrate. Right? This tympanic membrane will vibrate as the sound waves hit it, and that gets transmitted to these three small bones here, known as the malleus, inca, and stapes. And you need to know them by that name. If you do an exam, do not give me the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. I want to hear malleus, incus, and stapes. And you need to know the order that they come in from outer to in, or in to out, as long as you identify them. But these three bones are essential in order to be able to transmit that vibration, right? Now, to the inner ear. Now, in, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> when this tympanic membrane vibrates as a function of the sound waves hitting it, it moves this small bone here, the malleus, which now moves against the incus. And by the way, 
these joints here, a joint here and a joint here, are freely movable, which makes them likely to be what type of joint? Freely movable, like the freely movable joint in my knee. The synovial joint, right? Yeah. All right, and these are, these are synovial joints between these bones here. And now, you have associated with the middle ear here, this eustachian tube or pharyngotympanic auditory tube, right? And it extends down to the back of the throat here. Now, usually this guy stays compressed and it's almost closed, but every once in a while when you get a bad cold, this guy starts to get clogged up, doesn't it? And when it gets clogged up, doesn't it impact your ability to hear? So the reason that you have this tube here is you have to equalize the pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane, otherwise this won't vibrate. Now, has anybody ever taken a long flight with a very, very young child, kind of less than a year old? Maybe not, not your child, all right? The one sitting next to you. Was it a pleasant flight, especially landing and taking off? Now, <clears throat> This young child doesn't recognize or realize that usually this guy stays fairly closed here. Right? And when you take off and you land, the pressure in the cabin will change. Right? So the pressure out here changes. But because this guy's closed off, the pressure in here did not. The pressure went down outside, this pressure stayed high, and all of a sudden it's pushing against this tympanic membrane. And that will hurt. And their response to that is crying. Now, so many times parents will be flying and they don't recognize this. I mean, they'll sit there and they will unconsciously swallow or yawn. Right? You can even hear your eardrum pop a little bit. And they'll equalize the pressure for themselves. But they don't think that that's what's happening to their child. Right? This pressure hasn't been equalized for them. So what they'll do is say, oh, he must be hungry. So they give him something to eat. Now, just that process of drinking will now open and close this eustachian tube and the pressure will equalize. And so they think, well, he was just hungry, when in fact, it hurt. Right? And so what he wanted to do was actually equalize that pressure. So next time, you know, when you have that one-year-old or six-month-old, just look him in the eye and say, yeah. And will that work? Probably you just give him a bottle and be all right. All right, <clears throat> so this middle there, all right. It's called the tympanic cavity. We have a tympanic membrane here, the eustachian tube that runs down. It's flanked right on the lateral side by the tympanic membrane, on the medial side by this bony wall, which is part of the temporal bone here. <clears throat> this temporal <clears throat> or medial side here also has what's associated with it called an oval and a round window. It's effectively the connection to the inner ear. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. This tem uh, temporal bone here, this region of the temporal bone here, is particularly dense and hard, which is a good thing because you have some canals running through it. And if it wasn't particularly hard, this would be susceptible to breaking. So it's known as a, a petreous type bone. Right. <clears throat> Since that, the phalangic tube or the auditory tube connects that middle ear to the nasal pharynx. You need it there because you need to make sure the pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane has been equalized to maximize the ability of this tympanic membrane to effectively transmit those sound waves to the inner ear. Anything that inhibits that is going to inhibit your ability to be able to hear. These three small bones, right, they're called ossicles. <laughs> They are suspended by ligaments right, and joined by synovial joints. Right? These ossicles, malleus, incus, stapes, they take that vibration from the tympanic membrane and they transfer it effectively to the oval window, which is in uh, the, sort of the entry point to the inner ear. Okay. They're arranged in a fashion and in a shape that actually maximizes their ability to be able to transfer this vibration. Right? So they have evolved in order to be able to most efficiently 
take that sound wave and move it to the middle ear. In the inner ear, right? The inner ear then sits on the other side of this oval window here. The last bone of the ossicles here is the stapes, and it's sitting here attached to the oval window, right? Which is effectively that boundary between the middle and the inner ear. <clears throat> now remember, the inner ear is associated with both balance, orientation, and hearing. So it does both parts. It consists of a cochlea, semicircular canals, and the vestibule. The cochlea is always easy to identify. It looks like a snail. The vestibule is effectively the space that sits between the cochlea and the semicircular canals. Now these semicircular canals, it's like half a circle, right? but they're oriented very particular fashion. They're oriented because you have three of them in order to be able to be in an X, Y, and Z plane. That allows you complete orientation for equilibrium. If you miss one of these guys, if one is missing, you're losing one of those planes that you need to be able to sense for equilibrium and balance. Now, both of these, the cochlea and and the semicircular canals, as well as the vestibule, are filled with a fluid. <clears throat> that fluid takes that vibration from <clears throat> the stapes <clears throat> and transmits it now to both <clears throat> the cochlea and somewhat, but not much, to the semicircular canals. The semicircular canals are associated most with equilibrium and balance. But now, you know, take that vibration in the cochlea will start to take that vibration and interpret it effectively. So in the cochlea, right, this sound hit, <clears throat> was picked up by the outer ear, transmitted through the middle ear, and now the stapes vibrated against this oval window. This oval window is sitting against the cochlea here. This component of the cochlea is known as the scale vestibule. This is filled with fluid here. When this vibrates, it causes a change in the pressure of this fluid in here. And so this fluid will increase or decrease in pressure. And depending upon the frequency of the uh, wavelength that hit it, it will vibrate a particular area of the basilar membrane. And so now that sound wave has been transmitted or converted into a wave of fluid activity. <clears throat> At a higher frequency, you know, 20,000 hertz, right? It vibrates near the end, right? At a very low frequency, <clears throat> or near the beginning here, it vibrates at the very end here. The part of this um, <clears throat> inner basilar membrane that gets vibrated will dictate the type of sound that you hear. So take a look at this, and we're going to see these when we do this in the lab. We'll do this in the next section as soon as we get down with the muscle. By the way, how long? Yeah. Um, what type of fluid is it? Is it more like a mucus or water? It's a very thin fluid. They call it uh, a lymphatic fluid. Um, it has a salt in it, sort of like plasma. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the name they give to it is a perilymph. Right? So it's sort of like lymph fluid, but it doesn't have lymphocytes in it. Now, when we get to the third part, or the last part of the lab, we're going to take a look at some histological sections, and you can see all these components of the organ of corti here that's in the cochlea. But right now, how are muscles going? You guys feel pretty good about them? We had this last week before we do the exam. Right. So make sure you spend time. The one, uh, I guess, common comment that I've been hearing most is, it's the hands and upper arms that people are having the most issues with trying to remember right now. Right, so make sure you spend the time with them. All right, this organ of corti. It extends the entire length of the cochlea. Right. That stapes vibrating against that oval window causes a vibration to occur that's transmitted through this fluid. Right. 
So it comes in here, <clears throat> the, the oval window impacts at the end of the scale of the stibula, and it passes, that vibration passes through here, goes down to the end, turns around, and comes back towards us through the scale of tympanic. Sorry, in the middle here then is located <clears throat> this cochlear duct, right? The scale of medium. This is where sensing that vibration occurs. Right? And so these two components here, the scale of vestibuli and the scale of tympani, are here in order to be able to effectively be these ducts filled with fluid that allow that sound wave to be transmitted and move through. So sounds of different frequencies will vibrate different regions of the basilar membrane. Right? This is the center part. Right? And so if you have a high frequency, right, it'll vibrate it early. Right? And that gets translated, sent to your brain and translated as a high-pitched sound. If it's a very low frequency, right, this media or the perilymph gets uh, vibrated, transmits that sound, and it vibrates the very end of the basal membrane, and it gets interpreted as a low frequency sound. And you might imagine you can have a whole combination of high and low frequencies all together. You're sitting there listening to uh, know, some, some music in the evening, and you're vibrating all regions right, of this basal membrane. When that gets vibrated, right, <clears throat> what it does is it stimulates these outer hairs right, on the hair cells here. When these guys get stimulated or moved back and forth, they then send a message through the cell that's picked up by this auditory nerve. Right, this auditory nerve then gets stimulated and sends a message back to the brain. Right. So really, it's the moving of those hair cells right, in that basal membrane, which actually stimulates the nerve endings those dendrites to be able to send a message back to the brain for interpretation. Now, let me ask you this. These guys, these neurons are sending a piece of information, a sensory piece of information back to the brain. Are they an afferent neuron or an efferent neuron? Can you say that one more time? Mm -hmm. Look at the end of this cochlear nerve here. Right, it sent out some dendrites here, and these dendrites then got a message from this cell. They picked them up and it sent them back to the brain for interpretation. Are they afferent or efferent neuron? Are they assessing the sense or are they affecting a response? I'm hearing, right? I'm assessing. So they're after. Good. I'm not just doing this to irritate you. Right? Later on, this is going to be important. Well, I am doing it to irritate you too. All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> these sound vibrations, right? <clears throat> they beat against the eardrum. The eardrum pushes against the ossicles. The ossicles, the last one of the state beats, right? At the oval window, the stapes then presses against the inner ear, which causes that fluid then to be moved around. Right? The movement of that fluid effectively stimulates these hair cells. Stimulating the hair cells causes them to send a message to the cochlear nerve, and as an afferent nerve, it sends an impulse back to the brain, and the brain interprets it. High pitch, low pitch, right? depending upon what part of the basal membrane got stimulated. When you talk about sound, right, we describe sound in two words, all right, frequency and amplitude. <coughs> frequency is effectively the number of sound waves that pass for any point in time. The more you have for this unit piece of time, the higher the frequency. Right. Now, <coughs> amplitude, however, is how intense that frequency is. It's loudness, right? And so you can have high frequency, a lot of them, a lot of sound waves over a short period of time of high intensity, right? Or you could have the opposite, you know, low frequency, right? very few waves over that unit period of time, 
and still high amplitude, right? Or any combination thereof, right? So loudness, right? When we depict something as being loud or soft, right? It's very subjective as a function in part on uh, how good your hearing is. Right? And as you get older, you lose your hearing, like it or not. Right? That's why when you guys complain, I never hear it. Right? <clears throat> and part of that is because those hair cells start to degenerate. Now you can do this to yourself early on if you subject yourself to extremely loud, high frequency noises early in life. And that will damage those hair cells. And when you damage them, they don't grow back. <clears throat> so deafness, by any hearing loss, any hearing loss that a patient has is considered deafness, even if it's minimal. There are two general types of hearing loss. Right? It can be the result of conduction or <clears throat> sensory neural deafness. Conduction deafness Right? It's just simply something has happened such that that sound wave doesn't get transmitted very efficiently to the inner ear. Right? Maybe it's been three years since you cleaned your ear. Right? And the wax will build up in there and you just can't get through it. Maybe you have otitis media, which is an ear infection. Right? Maybe that inner ear has an infection. Right? And it's oftentimes a staph infection. Right? And so now, it has deadened the ability or minimized the ability to conduct <laughs> that vibration. Right? You can also rupture your eardrum. I mean, that'll do it. Right? Or, right? <clears throat> otosclerosis, if those ossicles no longer have that functioning synovial joint in there and they fuse, they can't conduct that vibration very well. But as far as deafness goes, right, if it's conduction deafness, we can address that to some point with a hearing aid. Because all hearing aid does is it increases the vibration. If, however, deafness is a result of sensory neural deafness, right, those neural structures get damaged, the hairs, the hair cells get damaged, the neurons, and the endron drives get damaged, we can't fix that. Right. Now, there are some people who have a damage to the cochlea, and we are at the point now where we can do cochlear implants. We can take out their whole cochlea and put in a new one and return some of the air, which is really pretty cool. <clears throat> there are other hearing disorders that we have, like tinnitus, right? Ringing in the ears, right? There's no sound around, and you still hear this ringing in your ear. Right? I've had it since I've been born. Right? And after a while, you just don't notice it anymore. Right? <clears throat> But other, there are some drugs that will cause it. In fact, aspirin can promote tinnitus for some folks. Right? <clears throat> if you have an inflammation in your inner ear or middle ear, right? it can also create this tinnitus. Right? There is a syndrome called Meniere syndrome. Right? <clears throat> it affects the cochlea and the semicircular canals. Now, remember, we said that those semicircular canals in the cochlea, not only are they associated with hearing, they're associated with balance. And so if you have an illness that impacts them, you're going to impact not just your ability to be able to hear, right, but your sense of balance and equilibrium too. Right? And so these folks also suffer from nausea and vomiting, right? feeling like they're falling. Okay, <clears throat> that's the hearing part. What about the balance part? So let's go all the way to the inner ear and let's focus on that for a few moments and talk about the semicircular canals, the role of the cochlea, and this vestibule, and being able to maintain balance. By the way, what did you see first? You saw. I saw the kids. You saw this first. Yeah. Did anybody see this? The two large faces. I see it now. Yeah. Now first. Now first. Okay. It says something about you, but I'm not going to interpret that. What, what did it, you see now? What what I saw everything. What does it say about you? Yeah, what so it I'm, say? I'm just going to leave that when we do the psychological interpretation part of it. We'll get that. Okay. All right. Now. Balance and equilibrium. All right. Here we are. We're in the inner ear. Okay. It deals with balance and equilibrium. The vestibule and semicircular canals play the largest role here. These both contain sacs of fluid. All right. 
in the vestibule here, right? It's egg shaped, right? This here, you know, that oval uh, <clears throat> window is sitting here, right? The oval window that contacts our uh, has the stapes on the other side of it, it's sitting in here. But this region right here, just prior to the cochlea and in between the cochlea and the circular canals is the vestibule. And this vestibule has two sacs, a saccule and a uterocryl, right? <clears throat> it contains the cochlear duct and the semicircular canals. Right? And these sacs with the fluid in there are responsible for us being able to have equilibrium and be able to respond to changes in gravity. Right? I know I'm falling to the right, right because of the vestibule. That I have inside my head. And what, Matt, what is that like if you're at zero gravity? Do you feel like you're falling all the time, or do you never feel like you're falling? It's a strange feeling, right? All right. This vestibule, right? <clears throat> two fluid filled sacs, right? The saccule and the utricle, right? <clears throat> These two components here are responsible for us being able to sense the straight line changes, right? Well, right, right. <clears throat> they have receptors that are located in this area called a macula, right? So here, we're talking about this region of the inner ear. This is the vestibule in here. And so these two regions here, the macula, they have sensors in there that are effectively responding to the movement of the fluid in the vestibule. So like say somebody's like inebriated and like they're they're disoriented. Is that like they can't, you know, like they're can't walk straight or something? Does that have anything to do with yeah, they're misinterpreting the sign uh, the signals that are being sent to them from the vestibule and it's on a circular canal. Right. So that's, they can't stand straight. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so now they've deadened the other senses in the brain that are trying to interpret these responses here. Now you can do that so yourself artificially, right? Do they still have merry go rounds in the playgrounds? Or are they too dangerous now? I mean, when I was a kid, you just put anything in the playground, right? If you got hurt, yeah, I'm wrong. walk it off. Do they still have merry go rounds in there? Or you yeah. get on these things and you push them and you spin them as fast as you possibly can so that the kids actually fall off? It's like they, they have them at some, but like a lot of the little ones don't have them. Yeah, well, we were on them all the time, right? And the real challenge was you can go fast, but the faster you went, the better it was. We got them going so fast sometimes that you try to hold on and it just didn't work. It, the centrifugal force just threw you off. So have you ever done that? Get thrown off of that and then tan it up and try to walk? It's a strange feeling, isn't it? What if, how come some people can handle that better than others? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. They, and their connection between what they're seeing, right, and what they're sensing in their inner ear is better than what it is for other people. Because your vision also plays a role in being able to orient yourself. I always wondered how can these skaters spin, you know, 100 revolutions a second there and then just stop and then go do a jump. I don't know how they do it. Now, part of it is they try to minimize the amount of time their head moves, right? But I couldn't do it. All right, so this vestibule in here is a fluid filled cavity. But the question here is yeah, there's fluid in there. Right. And the message is sent to the afferent sensors here, to the brain to be able to interpret it. But how does it work? How does that vestibule actually sense the movement of that material? Well, there's fluid in here. When that fluid moves back and forth across this macule in here, right, this membrane stimulates these hairs that are associated with it. The stimulation of these hair cells in here, right, called <clears throat> canalcilium, right, <clears throat> and sterocilia. The stimulation of these guys is a function of moving this otolithic membrane across the, the top of them, and this gets moved because the fluids in here are sloshing back and forth across the top of here on the otoliths. Right? That gets interpreted with respect to the type of movement that you're experiencing. <clears throat> Now, the other part, the semicircular canals, right? they also play a role in sensing movement. Right? These guys are responsive for rotary and angular movements. Now, if you look at the way they're oriented here, we said they're here in an X, Y, and Z plane. Well, it makes sense now that these guys can be responsive to angular movements because they're sensing all three planes. 
<clears throat> so when you turn in a circle, there are also <laughs> little sacs that are associated, and these guys are filled with fluid too, little sacs associated with them here with these semicircular canals that are sensing the movement of that fluid again. <clears throat> The little sensing areas in here, right? They're called crista ampullaris. Little sacs that are associated with them, and <clears throat> each of these semicircular <clears throat> components of it, <clears throat> they identify two thirds right of the circle, right, lying in all three planes. That allows us to be able <clears throat> to sense all three planes of movement here. <clears throat> This crystal ampullaris in here has the sensing components that are associated with the movement of the fluid in these semicircular canals. And so if you look back, if you were able to look back in here, you would find this very similar to what's happening in the vestibule. Right? As you move your head, the fluid moves. That fluid then disturbs these hair cells right in the crystal ampullaris. The disturbance <coughs> of these hair cells then gets interpreted or sent back to your brain and interpreted as which plane you're moving in. And so now your brain can interpret that and tell you the relative orientation. Right? Your eyes also play a role in this. I mean, your eyes are also telling me I'm standing upright or I'm leaning to the right. right? That, coupled with what comes from my semicircular canals, gives me orientation. Right? So if I lose one, have you ever walked through a dark room at night and find that it's harder to keep your balance? I mean dark, pitch dark. Have you ever experienced pitch darkness? Absolute darkness. It's hard to get around it. Not just because you bump into stuff, but it becomes harder to keep your balance too. <clears throat> and so your eyes coupled with <clears throat> the information that's coming from your semicircular canals helps you to be able to sense your orientation. Now, sometimes, <clears throat> What you see is being interpreted differently from what your semicircular canals are sending to your brain. Folks who suffer from this often will suffer from motion sickness. And so the way we treat this, these anti-motion drugs like meclizin or scopolamine, what they're doing is they're blocking acetylcholine. They're blocking a neurotransmitter. So that it doesn't send that impulse back to your brain. And so now they don't feel that disorientation or that nausea that they usually have as a function of their eyes not seeing or being interpreting the same motion that their ears are. Has anybody ever experienced motion sickness? No, I haven't. You have not? Yeah, question. Right. So I get the, the, the drugs um, block acetylcholine. Does that have anything else to do with other sort of like muscle contraction? Ah, that, well, that's that... a good question, right? I mean, you could OD on these guys, right? And it starts to impact muscle contraction. But you, the, the, the concentration is not high enough in order to be able to have an impact. In fact, one of the drugs they do to use is belladonna. Right? Too much of that, right? And it's good night. Okay, hearing, motion, so now we can move and stand upright, I can hear myself fall, I, I can taste my surroundings and smell them, but I still haven't been able to see them, right? So let's move to see. <clears throat> my advisor in graduate school, <clears throat> Keep me into this fellow, Antonio Mercado. He had a very nice saying here, right? About the eye. Right? And just if you think about it, it's so true, right? The eye that you see, right? What makes it an eye is not because you see it, but because it sees you. Right? That's cool. All right. All right. Let me ask you this. What would you do the eye if you had to choose? You're gonna have to lose one of your senses. Which one you giving up? Which one you giving up? So hearing, okay. Anybody, anything different? What if, is it, if I lose one? You gotta lose one. Does We're taking other, one. Does they feel the other senses get amplified? Uh, not, not initially. No, initially you're just gonna lose the one sense. 
Probably taste. I would say taste. Taste? Taste? No, I love smell. I'd rather take away smell. Oh, smell. Smell? smell? You do lose some of your taste, but you still have smell. Yeah. Is anybody willing to give up their vision? No. 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 70% of all sensory receptors are in the eye. Are you reading ahead? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And which is not surprising, right? I, that would be the last sense that I want to give up. Right? I'd give up every one of them except for that one. You, <clears throat> even my sense of belonging, right? I'll give that up first. 70% of all receptors are in the eye, sensory receptors. There's a reason for that. The eyes do an extremely complex interpretation of our surroundings. Not only can they tell you the shape of something, they can give you a sense of depth, color. Right? They really do provide a huge amount of information that goes to the brain. Right? And 70% of all the sensory receptors contain within about a one inch or 2.5 centimeter space, right? Now, <clears throat> the eyes are uh, protected, right? <clears throat> there's a uh, cushion of fat that surrounds them, and they're sitting in this bony orbit, very easy to pick out in the skull, right? We have a number of structures that are associated with the eye to help protect them and to keep them healthy, right? and we're gonna look at a few of those. <clears throat> the eyelid, for one, right? The palpebrae. Right? And they are there, the eyelid, right, to protect your eyes. Now, you walk out on a windy day, you end up squinting or turning away from it to try to protect your eyes from all that stuff that's floating or being blown through the air there. Even when it's not windy out there, you find yourself blinking every three to seven seconds. And since now I've made you aware of it, you will almost certainly blink every three to seven seconds. Right? <clears throat> when you do this, though, it helps to make sure that the eyes don't dry out. Now, has anybody ever tried, who has a cat here? Anybody have a cat? Have you ever tried to stare down your cat? Have you won? Why? What is it about this cat? I used to have a cat. I, I stared him down once. Yeah, he's gone now. Don't animals have, I think pigs have it too. They have like a second eyelid that goes like that, and then the, the skin one goes like that, right? Yeah, but I don't think cats do. Okay. No, I think cats are just, Alien. Because, I mean, cats don't really like this. They just put up with it, right? Thank you, on something. Yeah. That's why we got that goat. Hey. All right, so you blink on a regular basis to try to make sure your eyes don't dry out. When you do that, it spreads mucus and oils, saline, right, across the surface of the eye. <clears throat> There's a particular area called the lacrimal caruncle. Right? It contains those glands that secrete a whitish, oily secretion. When you wake up in the morning and yawn, right, and you got that little deposit in the corner of your eye, right? well, that's what came from your lacrimal caruncle. It just dried out a little bit, and now you're left with some sleep in your eye. These tarsal glands, the mybomian, or mybomian glands, they're sebaceous glands. They secrete <clears throat> products in order to be able to make sure that your eyes stay lubricated. And the ciliary glands, right? They lie between the hair follicles. <clears throat> so if we take a look at it pictorially, right, we're talking about these components of the eye here, of the eyelid. Right. <clears throat> the bulbar conjunctivita, <clears throat> conjunctival sac, right? The palpial conjunctiva, right, <clears throat> these transparent membranes, they have delicate mucous membranes and they produce this lubricating fluid right, that helps to keep your eye from drying out and help to protect it from objects. In fact, I've had something, will pull my, have you ever, your uh, eye doctor ever told you if you get something in your eye, don't rub it? Well, I'm telling you, if you get something in your eye, don't rub it. Right? The last thing you want to do is move that particle if it's there across the surface of your eye you know, and it's scratching it. Just try as best you can, you can keep your eye shut and let it wash down and out first or get something to wash your eye out. Right? But don't rub your eye. <clears throat> this lacrimal components are there. The glands that are associated, they're associated with ducts, right? If you're gonna secrete something, you have to have a way in order to be able to drain it. 
And so there are lacrimal ducts that are associated with the eye here. <clears throat> you can have uh, <clears throat> secretion. We can secrete tears, right? This lacrimal secretion. Tears are more than just a drop of salt or saline. Right? Tears oftentimes contain a certain amount of mucus. There are oftentimes some antibodies in there, believe it or not. What antibodies do? Anybody get their flu shot yet? What do you hope happened when you got that flu shot? Not that you got the flu. What yeah. do you, why won't you get the flu? Is antibodies? Yeah. Because yeah. it promoted the response. Right. And you hope now you have circulating antibody. These 160,000 Dalton proteins that find and attach to a foreign molecule. Very specific. And you can find some of those in your tears sometimes. There are also, and there's an enzyme in there called lysozyme. Now why would your eyes, your tears, what's the advantage of having lysozyme in here? Well, you have to ask yourself, this is an enzyme. What does it chew up? It happens to chew up the peptidoglycan outer wall of bacteria. And so you actually secrete something in your tears that helps to minimize the chance, doesn't eliminate, helps to minimize the chance that you get a bacterial infection. That's neat. Okay. Now, even what's neater than that, right, we now know <clears throat> you are also some endorphins oftentimes that are secreted that are part of the tears. Right. Natural opiates endorphins are, right? like, uh, let's see, um, Oxytocin is a component. In fact, when <clears throat> when my wife gave birth right, to both of our sons, there were amount of tears that came from her eye, and I don't blame her. There were tears coming from my eye, and I wasn't giving birth. But part of that <clears throat> helped her in that there was oxytocin that was secreted in that, and oxytocin actually promotes a contraction and makes it stronger, helping her to deliver that child. Funny, what's also interesting about that, these endorphins that are secreted in the tears, have you ever seen a really sad movie and it made you cry? Nobody. Those tears contain endorphins that oftentimes help to relieve stress. And so it's a response to a stressful situation and you're trying to help relieve that. <clears throat> and so tears play a huge role, not just protecting and moistening the eye. But with that said, too, I think it's important for us to recognize here, too, since I got some guys in here, there are some movies where we're allowed to cry. These are only three of them. These are three very important movies. But it's okay for us to cry. Now, you guys are younger than me. When I was growing up, it wasn't okay for a guy to cry. But it is. And these three will invoke, invoke it every time, especially this one here. Okay. All right. This lacrimal acro apparatus that you have associated with the eye here, <clears throat> the lacrimal gland, right? It produces and secretes a tear, right? The tears enter, right? <clears throat> they enter <clears throat> via the excretory ducts of the lacrimal gland, right? So the gland makes it, they get released into the eye, it washes across the eye to help keep it moistened and clean and protection, right? Some protection, right? Then those tears, they can't just stay in here. You have to have a way for them to get out. And so there are lacrimal canaliculi, right? These are the little ducts right? <clears throat> that allow these tears to drain. They drain into the lacrimal sac, which now runs down and empties in the nasal lacrimal duct, right? in your nose. Which now answers another question. When you're crying, why does your nose run? Well, you can't help it, All right? You're generating tears, they're emptying into your nose. They gotta go somewhere, right? All right, the eye has muscles associated with it. These are easy muscles to learn. Not like learning the muscles in the lab right now. <clears throat> we learn them now, and we'll do them again for the last part of the lab, and you already have it down, right? Six extrinsic eye muscles. <clears throat> they are there to allow the eye to be able to follow objects, right, and help maintain that shape of the eyeball. You have four of them that are rectus muscles. Right? And these four rectus muscles, they're either on top or below, superior, inferior, or the inside or the outside, medial and lateral. It's that simple. 
And when you look at the eye, you'll be able to pick them up immediately. There's one on top. Oh, yeah, that's the superior rectus. There's one on the bottom. That's the inferior rectus. There's one near the nose. That's the medial rectus. There's one away from the nose, the lateral rectus. In addition to that, you have these two muscles here that effectively look like they wrap themselves around the eye, right? And they're oblique muscles, right? And there's one on top, and there's one on the bottom. Right? So you're either a superior oblique or you're an inferior oblique. And you can see them depicted here. It's easy, right? The oblique wraps itself around, right? Either from the top or the bottom. <clears throat> These rectus muscles, they are outside, inside, top or bottom. That's it. It's that straightforward, right? So if I were to give you that question on an exam, this is a gimme, all right? This eyeball, right? there's a structure that's associated with it. We know that it's effectively hollow in there. It's filled with fluid. You go through, and we're going to dissect a cow eye. Right? You can see how hollow it is once you get inside it. That's the last part of the lab, too. But <clears throat> this <clears throat> hollow sphere has three layers. We call them tunics, right? Known as a fibrous vascular or inner layer. The fibrous layer will include the sclera and the cornea. Right? <clears throat> the inner one right, sits in the middle. The vascular layer will include the iris, choroid, and ciliary body. And then the third layer, the inner, has the nervous endings in it, right? has the photoreceptors and, and neurons associated with it. We're going to look at these three components here. But first, before we get there, right, we said that this eyeball is effectively a hollow sphere, but it's filled with fluid right? and other important components. Right? The fluid that's in there is known as a humor. It's either thick and gel-like. If it's thick and gel-like, it's a vitreous humor. If it's of the consistency of water, very thin, it's an aqueous humor. These guys are separated in two different chambers. The vitreous, the thick humor, the gel-like humor, is in the rear bark, <clears throat> the posterior segment. Right? And it's there to help make sure you keep that eye round and the shape maintained. Right? The aqueous part is in the anterior part or the anterior segment of the eye. Right? This is the very water-like humor. Right? <clears throat> this aqueous humor is actually made by another component called the ciliary body. That aqueous humor that sits in the anterior part of your eye is what's responsible for the eye pressure that they measure when you go to the eye doctor. That's responsible for the intraocular pressure. Separating these two cavities, sitting in between the vitreous and the aqueous humor, is the lens. So anything forward of the lens, anything in front of it is in the anterior part, is in the aqueous humor. Anything behind the lens or posterior to the lens is the vitreous part or posterior segment. So on a cross section of the eye, we can see this. Where's the lens here? Oh, here. It's sitting right here. Right? So that means everything back here, all the fluid filling here is vitreous humor. Anything in front of it, and that includes this region right through here, is all aqueous humor. This aqueous humor, the amount that you have in here, puts a pressure in the eye. If you build up the pressure here, it pushes against this, which in effect pushes against the back of the eye. So it's important that this pressure be monitored and maintained. See here. So let me just identify here that lens, right? It separates the internal eye into the anterior and posterior segments. Posterior has the vitreous, and the anterior has the aqueous humor. Right? Part of the reason, uh, role of that vitreous humor, not just to maintain the shape of the eye but it's also there to help transmit light. <clears throat> it helps support the surface and it holds, there's a retina in the back of the eye there, and it helps to hold that retina firmly against the pigmented layer. You would be amazed, uh, <clears throat> what? 
you'll see it when we do the cow eye. When you get rid of that vitreous humor here, this retina effectively just falls away from the back of the eye. <clears throat> in the anterior segment, <clears throat> there are two chambers in the anterior part, two chambers, anterior and posterior. Right? Between the cornea and the iris, right? the cornea is that very outside part of the eye, the clear part, right? and then the iris, you can see that, that contains what determines the color of your eye. Right? That's an anterior region there that has aqueous humor in it. But behind that, there's another small region called the posterior region of the anterior segment, and that's between the iris and the lens. <clears throat> the aqueous humor in there <clears throat> is made continuously. Right? The aqueous humor is made by these cells called a ciliary process. And it gets deposited in the anterior chamber, both the posterior and the anterior part of it. When it's made, as it says, it's made continually, it drains. Right? And it drains via this canal, the canal of Schlemm. Right? If you block this, then that'll build up in there and that pressure builds up. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> it's important to continue to make the aqueous humor because this aqueous humor actually provides nutrients to that part of the eye. Right? Because these are living cells out here, right? They need to have waste taken away, nutrients provided to them, including oxygen, and so it's important that you continue to make it and let it drain out. Right. So here we are. This is the anterior segment of the eye. This is where we find our aqueous humor. Right. So the aqueous humor, again, formed by the ciliary processes. Right. It flows through the posterior chamber, right, through the pupil into the anterior chamber. Right. And so it's made in the posterior region here, flows through the pupil to make its way up to the anterior part of the anterior segment of the eye. Right? Once it flows through there, then it's ready to drain out. Right? That's a sclerovenous sinus here. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> also uh, <clears throat> the canal of Schlamm here that allows this aqueous humor to drain out of the eye. Right? So continually made in order to be able to provide nutrients and wash away waste. Now, if that doesn't drain properly, if something happens such that this aqueous humor continues to be made and it's not removed on a regular basis, you can produce or promote glaucoma happening. That's what glaucoma results from. Glaucoma is damage to the optic nerve. Now think of it, the optic nerve is all the way in the back of the eye. It's in that posterior chamber all the way to the back. But if this aqueous humor doesn't drain, it pushes against the vitreous humor, right? Because the pressure builds up in there. And it's slow, insidious, because you don't even notice it's happening until it's too late. Right? And it will damage that optic nerve. And when it does, there's no coming back. You can't recover the use of that optic nerve once it's been damaged. And so... <coughs> we monitor that intraocular pressure. So when you go to see the eye doctor and you sit there and they say, open your eye, and then they surprise you by blowing air in it, they're measuring the intraocular pressure. They're seeing whether it's building up right, in that anterior chamber. And if it is, they'll take steps to try to correct it. One of the easiest approaches is just simply to take a particular eye drop that promotes draining. Okay. It contains prostaglandin, right, and it helps the eye drain better. And for some folks, that has a dramatic effect. But you have to monitor it. You have to catch it. If you don't see your eye doctor and you don't know that this is happening, you'll be going blind before they can do something. You won't even notice it's happening. All right. So buildup of pressure here causes this to push against the posterior chamber, damages the optic nerve, and now glaucoma can set in. You have a lens that's associated with your eye. It's called a biconvex lens. All right, there's two shapes of lenses. You're either concave or convex, right? So you either. Bend this way or bend that way. 
What's this one? Concave. Yeah, concave. That means this must be convex, right? Mm -hmm. And your lens is biconvex. So that means both sides of it looks like that. Right. So the lens of the eye, biconvex, transparent, that's good, right? You want to be able to allow that light to move through it, right? It's flexible. Now, that's also extremely good that it's flexible, which means that in this biconvex lens, being flexible, if I pull it, I can make this diminish in distance here, all right? If I compress it, I can increase this diameter. You're doing that continually to your lens okay. to help you focus. Okay. So the convex, these lenses here, right, they allow for the focusing of the light. They allow you to be able to get a focal point at the right spot in the back of your eye. <clears throat> the lens is attached to the ciliary body. <clears throat> it's suspended or with suspensory ligaments, right? As you become older, right? The ability for this lens to be able to get thinner or fatter is reduced. Right? Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen to you. Right? And so as you become older, the ability to make it thinner or fatter reduces because the elasticity goes down. That means your ability to be able to adjust to an object far and away gets to be minimized. Right? And where you really need to be able to adjust is when you're up close. Right. Distant vision needs very little correction, but close vision needs correction, and your eye will automatically do it for you to a certain extent. They say when you get older, it doesn't work anymore, and so most of us will end up having to have reading glasses when we get older. Right. <clears throat> I still don't really need it. I just, um... All right, <clears throat> three layers. Right. We call them tunic, fibrous, vascular, and nervous. Let's look at the fibrous tunic. The fibrous layer of the eye. <clears throat> Dense tissue, avascular. Right? There are no veins running through them. Right? It's the outermost coat of the eye. Right? These two primary components make up the fibrous tunic, the sclera and the cornea. Now, the sclera and the cornea is one continuous layer. It's just that when you get to the cornea part of it, right, instead of being white and opaque, it's clear. Which is good because the cornea is passing across the front of your eye. Right? The sclera is out toward the back. You need to keep that cornea clear so that you allow the light to be able to go through it. The sclera is here, <coughs> helps to protect the shape of the eyeball and helps uh, be a spot for the extrinsic muscles to be able to anchor themselves. So let's identify. Here is an eyeball. Right? <coughs> Here's the conjunctiva here. Right? <coughs> the sclera surrounds. The outside of the eye here is the white part, effectively, in this prime. When you get to the front of the eye here, the anterior part, the sclera becomes clear. <clears throat> it's white in color <clears throat> on the back here because you have a lot of collagen that's deposited in here. This is effectively <clears throat> the white of the eyes. Right? <clears throat> when you get up here to the far anterior part, this cornea part, which is effectively an extension of the sclera here. It doesn't stop here. Right? And notice here too, remember that aqueous humor that's getting produced all the time by the ciliary cells here, it goes up through the front of the eye and comes down here and drain. Right here at this junction, near the junction between the clear and the opaque part of the eye is this primary canal for drainage of it, the canal of Schlemm that allows the drainage of that fluid. All right, <clears throat> the cornea, right, clear. It allows the light to pass through. Now, the cornea does some bending of the light, but it doesn't do what the lens does, right? This cornea <clears throat> has sheets of epithelial cells on its surface, right? And it's got a fair number of pain receptors that's associated with it. And you know that if you've got something in your eye, right? <clears throat> the nice thing about this, though, these epithelial cells can replace themselves on a fairly regular basis. Right. So if you do happen to uh, minor, get a minor stretch in your eye, these guys will repair themselves. Right? And <clears throat> another nice thing about the cornea right, is this, the cornea can be exchanged without any fear of rejection. Now remember, it's avascular. Right? 
There are no blood vessels, no lymph uh, <clears throat> uh, vessels running in there. And so the immune system doesn't have access to this. And so you can switch them back and forth, one person to the next if you want. You can take it off, and we do. We do <clears throat> uh, cornea transplants <clears throat> from cadavers. And so <clears throat> this cornea, which sits here at the front of the eye here, sometimes it can get damaged. Right? And if it does, right, <clears throat> this damage, if it doesn't repair itself, we can actually replace this point. Right. <clears throat> Another layer, the vascular tunic, right, or the uvea. Right. <clears throat> Middle layer, <clears throat> pigment. Right. Three regions associated with the vascular tunic, right. choroid, ciliary, and arteries. In the choroid region, right, <clears throat> highly vascularized. Well, that is in contrast to the sclera, right? right. <clears throat> Dark brown membrane <clears throat> forms the posterior portion, right? And the, this brown pigment, right? It's there because it's dark, it'll help absorb the light. Right? So it prevents scattering. You don't want to have the light coming into your eye and just bouncing off all around the place. Right? <clears throat> the blood vessels <clears throat> that are here present in the core region, right? Supply nutrition to every one of the layers of the eye. And so those supplying blood vessels that make sure the other tunics are viable all come through <clears throat> the choroid region. Okay. Again, we'll take a look at this eye here. Okay. Here's the ciliary body down here. And this choroid region, okay, stretching along the inside here. Okay. You see, it's effectively underneath the sclera here. And you'll see it when we cross section our cow eyes here. It's sort of a, this is very white on the outside of the sclerus and the choroid runs right underneath. It. And it's going to be very dark. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> pigmented, <clears throat> vascularized, and surrounds most of the eye. Right? You don't have it up here in front of the eye, but it surrounds most of the eye, the whole posterior region, and extends up near the anterior part. <clears throat> The vascular tunic also contains the ciliary body, right? This is the material that surrounds the lens right? and effectively attaches it and plays a role in being able to make it more compacted or more thick, right? Effectively <clears throat> causing this guy to get elongated or compressed, change the diameter across that. Right? <clears throat> There are ciliary or suspensory ligaments called ciliary zonules, and they hold the lens in place and upright. Right? Right. These capillaries of the ciliary processes here will also secrete a fluid. Right. And so if we take a look at here, right, the ciliary body is sitting here, right next to where the lens is here, and look, it's attached to it. And so if you can pull on these attachments and push, you can change the diameter across the lens here. That happens on a very regular basis. The iris, the iris of the eye associated with the vascular tunic, this is where you get your eye from. That's the colored part of the eye. It's sitting there between the cornea and the lens. It's made up of these circular radial muscles. They're very neat when we dissect them out of the cow here. Now these guys can adjust to either <clears throat> decrease or increase that opening in the eye, that pupil, right? In order to be able to increase or decrease the amount of light that's allowed to come through it. The color that's associated with the iris right, is all a function of one chemical, melanin. Every one of us, regardless of the color of your eye, have the same chemical in there that causes this color. We all rely on melanin. Whether you have blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes, purple eyes, right? It's all a function of how much melanin is in there. Now, with that said, who can tell me why it is that almost every time you have a newborn, they're in the nursery in the hospital, everybody always says, well, they have blue eyes. Nearly every time, well, their eyes are blue. Now the parents have blue eyes. Why are the baby's eyes appear blue? Oh, 
all melanin deposition increases with age. When this baby is just born, they're not very old, right? They haven't had much time for that melanin deposit there. And so the lack of melanin will result in a blue light color. As the melanin gets deposited, now the eyes will change their color. <coughs> And so here again, right, another component of the eye. Right? We see the iris ciliary body and the choroid component of the eye. Right? Here is the iris here, responsible for the color of the eye. Sitting in the middle here is a hole. Right? These little muscles that are associated with the iris here will expand or contract to make the diameter of this hole here, this pupil, either smaller or larger. Right? In fact, <clears throat> pupil dilation and constriction as a response or the result of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. You have two layers of smooth muscle associated with it. They either contract or relax in response to bright light, but they can also respond to a parasympathetic or sympathetic nerve input, which means when you go home tonight, and you walk up next to the one that you feel, they feel <laughs> I'm the only one, look them in the eye. If their pupils dilate, then you are the one. They are giving you a sympathetic response, right? They're increasing the diameter of this pupil here, bringing in more sensory information. If, however, <clears throat> And grow smaller, then it's probably because they're just tired. Okay? In fact, this is probably what your eyes look like every time I start talking. Right? All right. The inner or nervous tuning, right? The retina is part of that inner lining. Right? The retina it comes as an outpocket in your brain, it's the innermost layer and very delicate. It has two layers that are associated with it. It has a pigment layer. <clears throat> the outer layer <clears throat> that absorbs the light. Right? <clears throat> this pigment layer is a single layer thick, right? And it has cells that phagocytize photoreceptor cell fragments. Right? These guys will take photoreceptor cells that are broken down and be able to pick them up in order to be able to remove them. Right? Also, this pigment layer is stored by vitamin A. <clears throat> the retina. <clears throat> Is the neural layer. Right? It's the inner layer of the eye, and we'll see that again when we dissect the eyes. And this retina is directly responsible for the vision that you have because the retina contains three major types of neurons in there. They have photoreceptors. Right? These guys are responsive to light intensity. Right? And so they are transducing the light energy. And then you have bipolar cells and ganglion cells. Right? <clears throat> they spread from the uh, photoreceptors <clears throat> to the bipolar and ganglion cells. If you look back at the retina here, you can see these cellular components in here. Right? We have associated with here this bipolar cell, which is a neuron. Right? You have in the back of the eye, right, <clears throat> against the back of the retina here, rods and cones. Right? <clears throat> and these bipolar cells feed information that's sent to them from the rods and the cones up to the ganglion cells who then in turn become the optic nerve. All right, so light's coming in from over here and it's impacting on the back of the light here. It's being interpreted and that signal is effectively being sent back forward to go out through the optic nerve. <clears throat> and so the pigmented layer absorbs the light, has vitamin A in there, and the nervous layer is a thicker and transparent. Remember, we have vitreous humor back in here. This whole region, this whole posterior region here is full of vitreous humor, right? And it's there to help make sure this retina is held in place as well as maintaining the pressure in the back of the eye. It's transparent so that these light images can pass through here. <clears throat> in the retina, right, you have ganglion cells and an optic disc back there. These ganglion cells, right, they run along the inner surface <clears throat> and they leave, as we said, they become the optic nerve. In the back of the eye, there's a small region called the optic disc. And this optic disc is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. 
you are blind at the optic disc. Now, if you're very conscious about it, you can actually identify in your eye. If you can make yourself stare forward and not move your eyes, right, you can identify where that optic disc is because your finger will disappear. And so the light here moves in through the front of the eye and makes an impact on the back of the optic disc here. And the ganglion cells are taking that image or that message that's generated from these rods and cones back here in order to be able to transmit them up through the optic nerve and your brain can interpret them. So here is a cross section of the back retinal part of the eye. Right? The light's coming in from here. Right? So the light comes in, passes through this outer layer here, goes past the ganglion and bipolar cells and impacts on the back of the eye. This back part of the eye here is pigmented, right? so minimize the amount of light that reflects back out of here. And then these rods and cones play a role in interpreting what it is that uh, the type of light that's coming in. <clears throat> the cones are back there. <clears throat> and you can see there are fewer cones than there are rods. Cones give you color distinction. Rods give you intensity, lightness, and darkness. Okay. <clears throat> you guys need to stretch Can we finish this out. Close. Right, let's finish it out so you can get out here really right. <clears throat> When the light comes in here, it hits the back of the retina. Right. <clears throat> it causes an impulse to be sent from both the rods and the cones. And that impulse is sent back up through the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells, gets sent to the brain through the optic nerve, and it gets interpreted. To tell you what it is, you're, <clears throat> you're sensing. The rods, right? You have more rods than you do cones. And these rods are responsive to both black and white vision. Right? They give you the intensity of the light. They get concentrated in the back of the eye, <clears throat> of the eye here. You also have interspersed among them cones. Right? The cones are responsible for tip being able to distinguish color. Now these cones, right, they work really well if you're in bright light. But if you're in dark light, the cones are not very responsive to that. They're not very sensitive to that. <clears throat> and so if you're ever a witness and something happened at night, the lawyer is likely going to ask you, so what color was that car? Because they know they know that if it was dark out there, that you're not going to be able to distinguish the color of the car. You're just going to be able to say it was there. <clears throat> All right, so this is how it's oriented in the back of the eye here. The red light wave comes in, goes past the bipolar and ganglion cells, impacts on the back in the eye here in the pigmented layer, right? This pigmented layer is dark, so it minimizes reflection. And then the rods and cones pick up the image and send it back through the ganglion bipolar cells to be interpreted. Right. Now, <clears throat> there is a particular region in the back of the eye, not the optic disc, but another region near it called the fovea centralis. This is that region in the back of the retina where you get the best resolution. You get the clearest image of what it is you're looking at. And you will unconsciously move your eyes or your head to help make sure that the focal point lies or hits on this fovea centralis. You aren't consciously doing it. And there's a particular region of the brain that's associated with it called the corpora uh, quadrigemina. Right. <clears throat> we'll take a look at that when we look at the sheet break. Right. But this part, and it's called quadrigemia, because it has four little bulbules associated with it. Corporate bodies, four little bodies that make it up. It's easy to identify. But you will do, make unconscious movements to try and make sure the focal point lies here on this fovea centralis. <clears throat> this is the region, this is a sheep brain up here, right? If you take the whole of the cortex here and you gently lower the cere cerebellum back here, you will reveal the corpora quadrigemina. And we'll see that easily when we do the sheet frame. Right. <clears throat> so here we are, all the uh, essential components of the eye. They're outlined here for you. Here's the optic disc back here. Notice <clears throat> the fovea centralis is near here. And the fovea centralis is here near where the macula lutea is. 
for a macular degeneration? Yes? No? All right. In macular degeneration, you have vascularization that increases in the back of the eye here, and this will start to spread out of here from the macula. And if it starts to destroy this region right here, I could destroy the region around the fovea centralis. <clears throat> All right, light <clears throat> comes in through the front of the eye, goes through the cornea, goes through the aqueous humor, through the lens, through the vitreous humor, right? And so the narrow layer, layer, layer of the retina, right? The photoreceptors then pick it up. And <clears throat> this light gets refracted, right? The cornea is responsible. When I say refracting the light, you're taking these light, these planes or waves of uh, intensity of energy, they get bent. When you bend them, you're refracting them. <clears throat> the cornea is responsible for most of that bending of the light. Right? Then it enters the lens. Right? The lens too. Remember we said the lens can be made uh, greater or less diameter. Right? <clears throat> and that ability to do that lessens as you get older. That too will play a role in bending this light. And what it's trying to do is bend that light so it focuses on the fovea centralis. <clears throat> now, the banding of the light rays, right, it's going to occur, whether you like it or not, when this light meets a surface, right? Any oblique surface of different density, when it passes through it, it's going to bend that light. <clears throat> what you see, right, is light that's been reflected. Right? So I see you only because you are reflecting light. If, you, if that object appears white, it's reflecting all the visible wavelengths of light. Right? We have a very limited range of wavelengths that we can detect. But if it appears black, it's not reflecting any of them. It's absorbing all those wavelengths. <clears throat> when that light comes through right, <clears throat> that lens, that cornea makes its way to the back of the eye, right, it has been inverted and reversed. And so your brain has to take that image and correct it. So anytime you see something, that light has been turned upside down and give, presented as a mirror image to your brain. And now your brain takes it and turns it back the right way. Okay. So <clears throat> that just brings me to a point here. I look at the time of year here. At this time of year, I, I actually love the fall. It's my favorite part of the year. Like the leaves are falling. <clears throat> the seasons are changing, right? <clears throat> leaves. The leaves are beautiful out there. In fact, most of them have fallen already. But I still see some beautiful trees out there that have some interesting, amazing color associated with them, except for oak trees. Oak trees are ugly no matter where they are. They're either green or they're brown. Never a rich yellow or orange or red. Right? And they hold on to those leaves forever. And why are leaves appear the way that they do? You don't have to know this. I just thought it would be interesting for you. Remember, the color we see is the light that got reflected. In the spring, when the leaves come out and the tree is alive, those leaves are there because they want to absorb light energy. What's doing the job is this component in them called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll absorbs a particular wavelength of light. Chlorophyll absorbs light in the red, blue, and violet regions, right? It does not absorb green. It reflects it. Therefore, this leaf looks green. Now, in the fall, the tree is now effectively going to rest and is pulling the chlorophyll out of the leaf. As the chlorophyll leaves, it leaves behind any other pigmented material it might have. And those carotenoids absorb at a different wavelength. The carotenoids actually absorb green, right? and they reflect yellows and reds. That's why the leaves change color. So now you have something to share for the leaves. All right. We also know there are conditions that people will suffer from called red-green color blindness. Remember, those cones are responsible for the color that you see. Right? And so these cones, they perceive the spectrum or of the light uh, uh, wavelengths 
be able to tell the brain exactly what color it is that you're perceiving. And so you have both red and green cone. And that's why red and green color vision is the most common form of color, <clears throat> color vision that we experience, right? because it's either the red or the green cones that get impacted. Right? And so the deficiencies in one of these two cones will minimize or reduce the wavelengths of light that you can detect. Right? So exactly what is this? Right? I know what you're saying. I understand what you're showing. So let me ask you this. What number are you seeing? You see a number? Everybody see 29? Okay, you're still okay. How about here? Five. Okay, how about here? What about the pink bird? I'm just seeing, that's a, that's a different question, right? So if you get focused on the pink bird or the elephant, then this says something else. Oh, wow. yeah. I'll just couple that with what you saw when we saw the first picture. What do you see on this one? 57. How about here? Two. Well, uh -huh. you still need this one? 42. Uh -huh. Okay, how about this? Can you see it? <laughs> That comes from a movie. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> we <clears throat> can identify the type of colorblindness uh, folks have, and that's one very common test that we'll run. 